Well, trepanning is uh, making a hole in the skull. Well, the reason is to increase the volume of blood in the brain. And what does that do? Well, it gives you more energy and a bit more consciousness. Heartbeat in the Brain is a very disturbing documentary that was thought to be lost media for a long time. Let's investigate. If you enjoy internet mysteries, conspiracies and true crime, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. I also have a Patreon and a PayPal, so if you're interested in supporting the channel, feel free to check those out. Links will be in the description. While the topic of this video is unsettling to say the least, I won't be showing anything graphic. If you've got the stomach for it, you can head over to my Patreon and check out the uncut version of this video, which will feature clips of trepanation and details that weren't suitable for YouTube. I've been researching lost media a lot recently, and I came across a partially found documentary titled Heartbeat in the Brain. The documentary was directed by and starred Amanda Fielding, a drug policy reformer, lobbyist and research coordinator, and was filmed by her partner Joey Mellon. Amanda produced the documentary with the agenda of making trepanation available on the NHS. Before we discuss the documentary, let's take a look into the history of trepanation and what it actually is. Trepanation is the ancient practice of drilling a hole in the skull for various reasons. It's actually one of the oldest medical procedures known to man and throughout history has had a fluctuating but surprisingly high survival rate. The earliest trepanations were thought to have a survival rate of around 40%, so more people died than survived, but considering what a risky procedure it is, done so long ago without proper equipment, or even knowledge of pathogens and sanitization, that's not actually that bad. Between 5 and 10% of all skulls found from the Neolithic period had holes in them. Some even showed evidence of multiple trepanations, with the holes at different stages of healing, suggesting that they were done at different stages of the life, as opposed to all at once. In ancient times, trepanation instruments were basically just sharp objects made from flint, stone or obsidian. The Greeks and the Romans were the first to design proper medical instruments to perform the procedure. There seems to have been five main methods, varying at different times in history and different locations. Rectangular intersecting cuts, scraping using an abrasive instrument, circular grooving, cutting using a circular saw, and drilling several holes in close proximity and then cutting away the bone from in between. Throughout history, trepanation has been performed for both medical reasons and spiritual and religious reasons. It's still performed for medical reasons today, though it's more commonly known as craniotomy or craniectomy, in both procedures, the removed part of the skull is eventually returned. A craniotomy can be performed on a patient with a brain tumour. A section of skull is removed to gain access to the tumour in order to remove it. The section of skull is returned as soon as the tumour has been removed. A craniectomy is normally done following a traumatic brain injury or a condition that causes the brain to swell. A section of skull is removed to relieve pressure on the brain and is eventually put back, though it could be months after the initial surgery. If you've ever seen the Saw movies, spoiler alert, this is the procedure that Dr. Denlon does on John Kramer, and apparently that scene is actually pretty accurate. The bone flap cannot always be returned. Sometimes if there's an infection of the bone, an artificial bone will be used in its place. As far as I'm aware, there's no proven medical reason for a section of the skull to be removed permanently, and this is where voluntary trepanation comes in. Craniotomies and craniectomies performed by proper surgeons are relatively rare and often emergency surgery, though there are some people who have chosen to undergo trepanation for no valid medical reasons. The logic behind this is that when humans began walking upright, this reduced blood flow to the brain. All babies are born with a soft area on the top of the skull, which factually is to reduce pressure on the brain as it's growing so quickly. Theoretically, children have a higher state of consciousness before the skull closes, as when it does, the pulsation of the heartbeat is inhibited. The loss of pulse pressure affects the ratio of blood and cerebral spinal fluid, and that apparently contributes to the onset of diseases including dementia and Alzheimer's. 
Therefore, a hole in the skull is supposed to increase the volume of blood in the brain and allow it to pulsate as it should, a heartbeat in the brain. This apparently allows you to return to a childlike state in terms of consciousness. There are countless benefits that have been linked without evidence to trepanation throughout history, including relief from anxiety, depression and other mood disorders, less frequent and severe headaches, heightened perception, restoration of youthfulness, removal of bad spirits and higher energy levels. It's also believed that it can make you feel high. Someone in the Hole in the Head documentary said that if LSD was at 100, cannabis at 50 to 60, trepanation would be at 30. The popularity of the procedure has varied over time. When lobotomies were first performed before World War I, they somewhat replaced trepanation, though there was a renewed interest around the 1960s. Bart Hughes was a Dutch librarian and proponent of trepanation. After attending medical school, he was refused a degree due to his advocacy of LSD research and he even named his daughter Maria Joanna. He used to stand on his head to increase blood supply and supposedly experience a temporary high. Then he eventually moved on to promoting trepanation. On the 6th of January 1965, he performed trepanation on himself while someone took photos of it. He went to a local hospital to get an x-ray to prove that he had actually drilled a hole in his skull, a decision that would backfire. Psychologists saw him and suspected he was schizophrenic, so decided to hold him against his will for three weeks. He had to undergo various psychological tests, which surprisingly, eventually indicated that he was completely sane. Bart's extreme publicity stunt really brought awareness to trepanation and he wasn't the only one to get it done or to do it to himself. John Lennon from The Beatles was considering the procedure and even tried to get Paul McCartney and others to get it done as a group activity. Paul wasn't exactly down and the man John asked to perform it apparently believed that John already had a third eye, which seems to be referring to the possibility that his skull never fused together as is the case in around 10% of people, according to some sources. Joey Mellon, inspired by Bart, decided to attempt self-trepanation himself, but it didn't exactly go too well. He tried and failed twice before finally succeeding with the help of his partner, Amanda Fielding. The first time, he used a hand-turned trepanning device, and the second attempt caused him to end up in hospital, where he was reprimanded and sent for psychiatric evaluation. I'm kind of curious as to how he failed twice, but at the same time I'm not really sure I want to know. Did he panic and stop halfway through, or was penetrating the skull harder than he thought? The Hole in the Head documentary shows a few other people who have self-trepanned, most of whom speak positively about the effects. A woman who had to have the procedure done for medical reasons is also featured. She suffered a life-threatening injury, though doesn't specify exactly what, or why it was decided that the skull piece shouldn't be returned. She says her running has improved since the operation and she feels less stressed and more relaxed, though she acknowledges that these changes may be due to a change in attitude or the simple fact that she was so happy to be alive after the injury. Around a year after the procedure, she decided to have the hole filled in. It sounds like she was worried about her skull not being able to withstand as much damage if she got into an accident, which could cause brain damage. Since the hull was repaired, she says she doesn't feel as euphoric or full of energy, though she still has creative spurts, particularly when writing. She feels more stressed and recalls feeling carefree before the hull was filled, but thinks that might be because the novelty, for lack of a better word, of being alive after such a serious injury is starting to wear off. I really recommend checking out the Hole in the Head documentary, it is grim but fascinating. My favourite part though is the song at the end, which is basically just a mashup of phrases that people have said throughout the show, with a beat behind it. Time to stop the drilling. drilling. The operation is about to begin. It's an odd contrast between such a morbid topic and an upbeat tune. Anyway, now we've covered some context, let's move on to Heartbeat in the Brain, a title that makes me feel really queasy since I now know what all this is about. Amanda Fielding met Bart Hughes in 1966, not long after he self-trepanned. She already had an interest in the procedure, 
but it seemed like Bart inspired her, and after four years of trying and failing to find a doctor to perform the procedure, she decided to do it herself at the age of 27. She prepared well by getting all the tools she needed, including a spare drill in case the first one broke, which it did. As an advocate for trepanation becoming available on the NHS, she decided she was going to film the whole thing as somewhat of a publicity stunt. The documentary was thought to be lost media for some time, as it had never been seen since the first screening in 1978 in a gallery in New York. More than one audience member fainted, understandably, and everyone else was very shook up, so presumably Amanda had the only copy and kept it under wraps. That was until April 2011, when it was publicly screened at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. Again, the documentary was not well received. I don't think there's any way it could have been, considering the graphic and pseudoscientific nature. A few clips of Heartbeat in the Brain were shown in the Hole in the Head documentary, and you can also find some clips in season 3 of Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia. I'm not sure how long the procedure took or how long the documentary was in total, but you can only find around two to three minutes worth of footage online. As much as I am kind of curious to see the rest of it, part of me is kind of glad that I can't, because those two to three minutes were more than enough. They show brief clips of the preparation and the procedure itself, while Amanda explains what's happening, and stresses that she does not recommend that people try self-trepanation, as it's not a thing for lay people to do. She says she's showing the film now, with hopes that it might attract the attention of a doctor who is willing and able to start researching the topic. There are also random shots of her pet pigeon, and I like pigeons, but there's something very eerie about these shots paired with the foreboding music. Just that I'm absolutely not in favour of self trepanation. Maybe it's better to say it's a film about my beloved bard. As a side note, when Amanda is interviewed in Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, she says that she knows that telepathy exists because she had a quote, passionate love affair with the pigeon. Love making, sweet, and just enchanting how he'd do it with the sound. It was a very kind of complete. Love. I don't exactly know what that means, but she said that he was hypnotic and had a call that you couldn't resist. <coughs> anyway, after the procedure, Amanda gets dressed up and goes out to a party like nothing even happened. Eight years later, she said that the experience was as good, if not better, than she'd hoped. I've searched pretty thoroughly for the full documentary online, and if it even exists on the internet, it's certainly not easy to find. It's only been publicly screened twice, though Amanda has had private viewing parties with friends, so perhaps one of them had a copy and leaked it onto the internet. I found a few comments online, reviews on websites, on the videos about it on YouTube and Reddit, from people claiming to have seen the whole thing, or at least more clips than are available now. One user remembered seeing it on TV, and described small details that are not seen in the clips available on YouTube. Another recalled there being a URL at the end of the Hole in the Head documentary, which was supposed to be a link to the full Heartbeat in the Brain documentary, though they saw that years after the documentary was released, and by the time they typed in the URL, it was a dead link. These anecdotes could suggest that it is online out there somewhere, but they also could be partly due to false memories. Maybe the person who recalls seeing the whole thing on TV actually saw the Hole in the Head documentary on TV which features clips of Heartbeat in the Brain, and without realising, they just filled the gaps in the memory when recalling it years later. The URL which the Reddit user remembers being at the end of Hole in the Head is now unoccupied and for sale, though Wayback Machine shows a couple of archives. None of the archives feature the full documentary or any clips, and there's no sign that it ever did, though it's hard to say from the limited number. There are a few websites that claim to have the whole thing available to stream, but it seems to just be clickbait. By most accounts, the full documentary is not available and has never been released online. Amanda is well aware that it's a controversial documentary, and only allowed a few selected clips to feature in Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia. It sounds like she doesn't want to shock people, or to threaten her recent research into LSD, amongst other things. So it's unlikely that she herself will ever choose to release the film, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. In modern times, trepanation has become a very controversial topic, 
Those who were against it argue that you must be mentally ill to even want a hole in your head, let alone to drill it yourself. The vast majority of doctors agree that accepting necessary craniotomy or craniectomy procedures performed by medical professionals, trepanation has no medical benefit, and in addition to the risks taken when the procedure is performed, there are also potential long-term risks as well. We all have a skull for a reason, to protect the brain, so cutting a hole in it is bound to increase the risk of brain damage in the event of an accident, a risk that would increase with a larger hole. Most people in the Hole in the Head documentary only drilled small holes, no bigger than a centimetre, so their risk is probably relatively low, but I still feel like a hole of any size could surely weaken the skull in general. All evidence behind the benefits of trepanation is anecdotal and could easily be explained by the placebo effect. Trepanation, particularly self-trepanation, is such an extreme thing to do. You'd have to be very convinced that it was going to work and once you had done it, you'd probably be more likely to look for the benefits because you wouldn't want to feel like you'd wasted your time. I mean, imagine you just drilled a hole in your skull. You would not want to think that that was all for nothing. Proponents of trepanation argue that it hasn't actually been scientifically studied in recent times, so a lack of evidence doesn't necessarily disprove its reported effectiveness. There were some reports around 2018 of trepanation becoming a trend within the body mod community. Most seemed to believe it would elevate their consciousness, but it seems that some people just thought it looked cool, like a tattoo or a piercing. I hope no one actually got trepan just because they thought it looked cool though. According to Ryoichi Kerope, a body mod expert, it's still considered extreme modification in today's scene. It's mostly done underground because it's illegal in some places. So it's reassuring that it's not too common, but there's always a higher risk for those getting the procedure if it's not done by a medical professional. I wasn't able to find any reports of recent deaths as a result of self-trepanation, so hopefully they're not common. Following her self-trepanation, Amanda went on to run for British Parliament twice, attempting to make trepanation available on the NHS. Unsurprisingly, she never really got anywhere with that, but she is still an advocate and doesn't appear to have ever expressed regret about getting the procedure done. While I would never ever recommend getting it done, perhaps there is an argument to be made for doctors performing trepanation. Amanda couldn't find a doctor to do it for her, so she did it herself, and she wasn't the only one. One way or another, these people were going to get a hole in their head, if we can't stop them, maybe we should at least offer a safer way, as the risks are increased significantly with self-trepanation. That would also open up an opportunity for research if someone wants it done anyway and would resort to doing it themselves if they couldn't find a doctor. I want it done. They might as well study on me. I'm a fairly normal person. I'm sure there are people out there who have gotten this procedure done and regretted it, but clearly some people feel like it's totally transformed their lives. And at least some of those people have been the subject of psychological testing and found to not be mentally ill. Just to reiterate, I'm not in favour of the procedure whatsoever, I'm just trying to consider both sides here. I personally think the benefits that have been reported are more than likely as a result of the placebo effect. Trepanation hasn't been the subject of clinical trials, Though most doctors seem to agree that any reported benefits and the logic behind them stems from a misunderstanding of anatomy and biology. As a result, it's unlikely to be researched properly by credible scientists and the potential ethical issues posed make it very unlikely that a study of that kind would ever be approved. As well as her trepanation campaigns, Amanda has done a lot of research into psychoactive drugs over the years and believes that they should be legalised. She founded the Beckley Foundation in 1998, a non-profit organisation which investigates the effects of psychoactive substances on the brain and consciousness. It also focuses on reforming global drug policies based on health, harm reduction, cost effectiveness and human rights. Amanda herself has experimented with these substances. Articles in October 2019 reported that she'd been experimenting with psychedelics for 54 years. She's studied those substances as possible treatments for anxiety, depression and for various other reasons. She turned 78 this year and it sounds like she's still on it. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. Have you heard of self-trepanation and do you remember ever watching Heartbeat in the Brain? 
If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. Huge thank you to my patrons, whose names are on screen now. I really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next Thursday in a new video. Time to stop the drawing. drawing. <laughs>